I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Craig Barrett, the former chairman and CEO of Intel and the chairman of the Basis Charter Schools here in the United States. Uh, Craig, uh, it's to me, this is such a delight to be able to have a conversation with you and really talking today uh, about a couple of things. One about uh, lessons in leadership during times of uncertainty. And you've been probably through quite a few of those in, in your career. Um, and also just about your passion for science fairs and passion for education and young people. So let me just start out with, with, with my first question. You've had a pretty, like I said, a storied career uh, building a semi, one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world. Um, what was one of you, you think towards your, your path, what was one of the biggest achievements you felt during that time? Uh, actually, Maya, I would, I would count three achievements probably. One was to the opportunity to work with just an outstanding team of individuals, everyone from Bob Noyce, the inventor of the uh, integrated circuit, Gordon Moore, Moore's Law, Andy Grove, Ted Hoff, who invented the uh, microprocessor. Uh, working with those people was just an absolute thrill for over 35 years. Uh, the second aspect was, as you pointed out in your introduction, Intel was the biggest and best semiconductor company in the world. And we went from basically nothing in 1968 to the current run rate of Intel is about $150 million plus a day. So it's, it grew exponentially. It grew like Moore's Law over 50 years. Um, and then the third aspect was in fact associated with Moore's Law we were able to take the leadership and make Moore's law continue as an empirical law for over 50 years. You know, the, the first commercial product for Intel and integrated circuit was a 256 bit static RAM. The first big product was the 1103, the first dynamic RAM that went into computer memory, but one kilobit device. Now, you make devices with billions and billions and billions of transistors in them. And everyone said that Moore's Law couldn't last, including Gordon Moore, by the way, right after we forecasted it. But we were able to effectively follow that trajectory for 50 years. And I, I anything that doubles every 18 months or two years or so, over 50 years, is just unbelievable and i got to be part of that which was fantastic so you've also lived through crises the dot-com bust the financial meltdowns what leadership lessons would you offer during this time of incredible uncertainty well i guess that's a germane question for today we're in a bit of uncertainty today uh, the one thing i learned was that if you understand your business if you're in the technology arena and you understand the potential of your business you don't listen to any of the financial analysts when you have a downturn or a period of uncertainty you know the textbook response to the dot-com bubble burst in 2000 or the 2008 financial crisis was to stop spending to lay off staff to stop capital expenditures to stop expansion to wait it out and then when everything got good, start reinvesting again. Uh, we took an entirely different approach and it was an approach that intellectually we understood our business, we understood the opportunities, we understood that Moore's law was still going to be followed. And we had two choices. We could either do the conventional wisdom, stop, or we could continue to invest even in a downturn come out stronger in the end and defy the conventional wisdom. And we chose to do that each time. And by the way, you, you, you tend to develop a thick skin when you do this. And, and the thick skin is because everybody says you're crazy. Uh, and then one day for about two microseconds, when the business turns, they all say, oh, Intel was very smart to continue to 
because now they're doing better than they would have if they stopped investing. So you get two microseconds of fame and then it goes back to the ordinary business. But intellectually, if you understand your business, which you should if you're running a complicated business, uh, semiconductors, electronics, or something like that, you understand it much better than any of the financial community. You understand the possibilities. You understand the options. You understand the rewards you get if you take a chance. And we were able to do precisely that. We had a great board of directors which supported us during those that decision-making time. And we came out always stronger from a bad period of time, a bad economic crisis than when we went into it. And it was because we defied conventional wisdom. We continued to invest. We truly believed in what we were doing and the opportunities associated with what we were doing. And we all benefited from it. And it was a great feeling for those two microseconds. You know, during crises, leaders are encouraged to use emotional intelligence during challenging times. Do you have any words of wisdom? Well, uh, I think emotional intelligence gets translated into what I was just talking about. And that is, if you really understand your business and you believe in the business and the opportunities the business affords, then you can make contrarian investments uh, during a, a difficult time. And, and that it really is, it's divine conventional wisdom. So it's an emotional decision. I believe in Moore's law. I believe that it's going to continue. And if we don't continue to invest, we'll fall behind. So I'm going to continue to invest. And that means investing in your people, right? That you continue to invest in people. Yes, absolutely. And remember, the, the first answer I gave you in, in this discussion, when I you asked about what I was most proud of or excited about in my 35 years into it was the people, the people you got to work with. And it just an intellectual charge every day when you went to work. And you surround yourself with smart people and you can't lose. I feel the same way. You know, um, education is your public service and philanthropic mission. It always has been, it continues to be. While you were at Intel, you helped build the Science Fair Network globally for over 20 years. Why were you attracted to science fair and why are science fairs so important? Well, at Intel and as any high tech company, you're always interested in the next generation of workers and you want them to come as well prepared as possible to your company to have the best possible education. And we were primarily interested in math and science education. It's a, an engineering company. And we were relatively um, unhappy with the state of education, not only in the United States, but just the general preparedness of the next generation in math and science. And so we, we engaged in a process when I was CEO, we invested a little bit over $100 million a year in philanthropic investment just to improve math and science education for males, females, boys, girls, minorities, everyone. We just wanted to improve math and science education. And a critical part of that was not just what goes on at the classroom, the, the formal education, but Science and engineering and technology is a lot of uh, new discovery on a continuous basis, new work. And so you want people prepared to explore the unknown, not just memorize and give you the answer to problem from last year, but to do something new and in the future. And science fairs are just a wonderful training. In fact, my impression is the entire engineering or technical training scheme, which trains people to solve problems that they don't know the answers to, is such great preparation for life. And a wonderful example of that is if you look at the top Fortune 500 companies in the United States, 
and you look at the commonality in the education of the CEOs of those top companies, the most common denominator in their educational background is engineering. It's, they've been well versed in problem solving. And that problem solving technology that they've learned in their engineering discipline carries over into everything in life. All sorts of business problems, personnel problem, an advertising problem, a marketing problem, a manufacturing problem. All of those problems can be solved by the problem solving technology that engineers learn in school. And so we were just enthusiastic about helping to improve math, science, engineering education. It, it was a bit self-serving because we were hiring these people which, which had this improved education, uh, but it was the right thing to do. You know, the most important thing for any generation society is to give back to the next generation. And if you can prepare the next generation to be successful, then you've done your job. That's what we were trying to do. And science fairs, science technologies, search, science talent search, excuse me. I, after 20 years, I should get the name right. Um, and ICEF, those are the classiest uh, scientific competitions in the world. And what we wanted to do was to show young people that they could be successful if they applied these problem solving techniques, they could learn from that and they could carry that on with them in the future. And besides that, which you and the uh, societies do so well, they could get recognition. You don't have to be the star quarterback of the football team. You can have an opportunity to interact with people like you who enjoy science, who enjoy engineering, enjoy mathematics, and be with like people and be successful and get good recognition. And maybe earn a little scholarship money along the way. So, you know, it, it, Right now, during this pandemic, there are a lot of students who aren't going to be able to go into their high school labs or their research labs. Um, you know, they're going to be forced to do the research from home. Um, in, in what ways may technology play a role in that in their success now? I'm, I'm curious, what is your thoughts around research during a time of stay at home, right? Um, curious about that. Well, come on. During this interview, we're both staying home. I'm in the thriving metropolis of Darby, Montana, population of 500. And, and you're in the Washington DC environment and we're communicating like we're next door to each other. You know, what, one of the beauties of, of what Intel and other companies were able to do in the 1980s and 1990s was to create the infrastructure to build computer infrastructure, the internet, all the world's information accessible to you at the touch of a keyboard, communicate with anyone remotely. You know, it, it doesn't quite solve the problem of if you're doing a biological experiment with test tubes and you, you have to see what, the, what reagent you have to add and, and what goes on in the test tube. But much research today is done from a computational base. And, and computational experimentation is, is the wave of the future. I mean, it's faster, it's cheaper, it's more accurate, it's better than just manually cranking out numbers. So it's not a total solution, but using this technology gets you 95% of the way there. And you just have to take advantage of it. So there are a lot of um, young people right now listening to you from around the world, whether it's in the middle of the night in China or, uh, you know, uh, late in the day here in the United States. What, what words of wisdom would you give to young people right now who may be feeling like they haven't lived through something like this? What, what would you say to them? 
you know, I would, I've always got my best advice from uh, the ultimate source of wisdom, the Chinese fortune cookie. <laughs> and, and one of my most favorite fortunes, it's actually from Chef Chu's restaurant in Los Altos, California, in the middle of Silicon Valley. I opened up my fortune cookie one night and it said to me, the world will always accept talent with open arms. And talent is defined as education and skill and passion for what you do. And if you have talent, whether you're a plumber, a poet, a physician, a physicist, a poet, whatever you are, if you have talent, the world will accept you with open arms. And so I tell people, get the best possible education that opens doors. It's the key that unlocks the opportunity. And have passion for what you do. Do what's in your heart. If, if you don't have passion, even if you have a great education, uh, I don't think you're going to be successful. You're not going to be happy. You're probably not successful. But if you have talent, that education, the skill, the passion, and pursue that, you'll be successful. And so when people come and ask, you know, should I be a physicist or an electrical engineer or a computer scientist? What should I do? What should I, I say, follow your heart and have passion for it. Nobody can, can give you that passion. You can only give it to yourself. So, the Society for Science and the Public is going to be celebrating our 100th anniversary in 2021. And as a member of the Board of Trustees, which um, is, is wonderful for, for me and for, for, for the rest of our team, what do you see in the next 100 years? What, 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 what do you see the future looking like in the world? Well, if, if you look at the, the growth of knowledge and information in the world, it's on an exponential increase with no signs of slowing down. So just imagine the information and the understanding that's going to be available in the next hundred years compared to the previous century. Uh, it's, it's a huge opportunity. And that's why I suggested earlier when we were talking about remote study that uh, computer experimentation, designing experiments that you can do computationally rather than in reality with pouring chemicals and beating on pieces of metal and things like that, is going to be increasingly important because of this exponential increase in information that you have available to you. You can only use that information if your computer let it have the computer capability. So every research establishment I, I see, and then I have to be chair of the Carnegie Institution of Science headquartered in Washington, DC. It's 120 years old and it's worrying about what it's gonna do in the next 120 years. You're not quite 100 yet. But uh, the trend there is in fact, uh, interdisciplinary studies. And that's one of the great, uh, steps forward I think we've seen in the last decade or two and it's going to be increasingly important in the next hundred years. Combination of engineering and biology. It just opens up vast frontiers. But a lot of this work is going to be computational in nature, done with computational experiments. It's going to be interdisciplinary and this continued explosion of information and data available to us, I mean, it's not going to stop. So the next hundred years, God, you know, I'm 80. If I can live to be 180, that's cool. I'll join you in the next hundred years, but it's something to look forward to. Um, Craig, just to, to um, finish up, I mean, you know, we at the society are doing a big experiment doing this virtually uh, for young people and really having some of the greatest minds like yourself speaking and providing really great guidance and hope um, and understanding to this next generation of STEM leaders. Um, just in closing, um, 
are there just another couple of words of wisdom you'd like to tell our audience? Well, I can give you two more fortune cookies if you want. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Second fortune cookie comes from the Golden Phoenix and 16th Street in Phoenix, Arizona. It says, you can't win unless you choose to compete. And what that means in translation is everything in the world is very competitive and getting more competitive. And you have to choose to compete if you want to be successful. You can't just sit back. And it applies from a government standpoint, from a corporate standpoint, from an individual standpoint. Those entities which choose to compete and make themselves competitive will be successful going forward. And I think that's very important. It, it's, it's associated with this exponential increase in information that no matter what school we go to, no matter how well prepared we are when we graduate, after working five years, if you're not learning something new and applying that to your job, you're falling behind, you're not competitive. So the, the continuous learning cycle is a form of competition. The other uh, uh, fortune cookie, it's actually not a fortune cookie. It, I was in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and, and when you go to bed at night, they give you a good little piece of paper on your pillow, which is wishing you a, a nice sleep. But what it said, to me, it, exactly, it said, a small deed done is better than a great deed planned. And to me, my interpretation of this, it's the power of self-initiative, the power of the individual, and the beauty of what a single individual can do to change the world. Not the United Nations with their millennial development goals and eradicating hunger and uh, driving the literacy to zero and stopping wars. I mean, uh, or the US government and its debate about saving social security. But the world really moves on the actions of individuals, the small deeds done. And, and by the way, if you look in the technical world, um, there are huge research laboratories everywhere. Uh, my company that I was associated with Intel spending over $10 billion a year in research. Microsoft does that. General Electric does that. IBM does that. But if you look at really the great advancements, they're usually done by an individual with an idea. And that's the small deed done. And that's the power of the individual. So, you know, so with my three fortune cookies, the world will always accept talent with open arms. You, you can't win unless you choose to compete. And a small deed done is better than a great deed plan. I mean, that's the advice I give every young person that I meet that asks a question about what should I do with my life? Where should I go to school? What should I study? What company should I go to work for? Forget all that stuff. Follow my fortune cookies, then you'll be successful. Craig, what a wonderful conversation we've had. Um, thank you so much for your time today and for your words of wisdom. We're just incredibly grateful to you for everything that you've done. Thank well, you. Maya, let me return a moment. Thank you for what your team at SSP does. Thank you for driving ICEF, Science Talent Search, the Broadcom competition. It's key to the competitiveness and education of our youth. And I think you're, you and your team do an outstanding job and it's just a pleasure to be part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks.